Hello and welcome to Crash Course. Today we're going to be doing part one of the cardiovascular revision for first year, which will involve us taking a look at some of the basic physiology and anatomy that's covered in first year medicine. It'll be useful for second and third years for revision, but also for first years, particularly for your exam prep. So in today's video, we're going to be looking particularly at the basic principles of the cardiovascular system, then having a look at heart anatomy and also at embryology of the heart. In future videos, in part 2 and 3, we're going to look at the innovation and blood pressure of the heart, blood in general and the circulatory system, histology, and the cardiac cycle in the ECG. So to start with, let's have a look at a few multiple choice questions to ascertain A, what do you already know, and B, let's get your brain in the mood to do some cardiovascular revision. So question 1, cardiac output can be defined as, is it A, B, C, or D? At this stage, I'd recommend pausing the video to allow yourself some thinking time because uh, I'm going to go through these quite quickly so we can keep the videos as short as possible. So in order to answer this question, it's good to think that cardiac output is the amount of blood pumped by the heart in one minute. So then logically, you can work out that your answer is A because cardiac output is stroke volume times heart rate. And heart rate is the amount of times your heart beats per minute. And stroke volume is essentially the volume of blood pumped by the heart's left ventricle per beat. So times in those two together gives you the cardiac output. Question two, what is another name for the pacemaker of the heart? Is it A, B, C, or D? Here, think about the conductivity of the heart. Where does the um, impulse start? The answer is the SA node, so the sinoatrial node, because the order of transmission of the electrical node, uh, electrical impulse is through the SA node to the AV node or bundle, and then to the Purkinje fibres. Lastly, this is a bit more of a tricky question because you've got to eliminate the incorrect answers. So which of the following is true? Is it A, the arteries and veins both have valves? Is it B, that the AV valves have three cusps each? Is it C, that blood enters the left atrium from the inferior vena cava and the superior vena cava? Or is it D, that the left ventricle has thicker muscle than the right? So again, as we've said, try to rule out the incorrect answers to lead you to the correct answer. And the correct answer here is D, so the left ventricle has thicker muscle than the right. However, why are the other answers incorrect? Well, it's because A, arteries and veins both have valves, so that's not true, and only veins have valves. And the reason for this, well, why, is so they can prevent the backflow of blood. B, the atrioventricular valves have three cusps each. Well, this isn't true because the bicuspid valve only has two, and the tricuspid valve has three. C. Blood enters the left atrium from the IVC and the SVC. Well, this isn't true because blood enters the left atrium from the pulmonary veins. Blood actually enters the right atrium from the inferior vena cava and the superior vena cava. And the left ventricle has thicker muscle than the right. And the reason for this is that the left ventricle has to pump to the whole of the body, which is much further away from the heart than the lungs, which are really close, which the right ventricle has to pump to. So the musculature is proportional to that. But we'll cover all of these concepts a little bit later on. So basic principles of the cardiovascular system that is really important to understand is that the heart's a cone-shaped organ about the size of your fist and it sits within our mediastinum in our thorax. It's slightly left of the midline so it's not perfectly in the centre and it's good to understand the borders of the heart as well. So its lateral borders are the lungs either side, its posterior border of the back is the vertebral column, its anterior border of the front is the sep sternum and then the inferior border below is the diaphragm, it sits on top of the diaphragm. Essentially, it's made up of four chambers, so two atria at the top and two ventricles below, and the left and right atria are separated by that interatrial septum, and likewise the ventricles are separated by an interventricular septum. Valves, as we've already discussed, prevent the backflow of blood, and are only present in veins, not in arteries. The heart valves, so you have two AV valves, so you're bicuspid with two cusps on the left-hand side, and you're tricuspid with three cusps on the right. Then you've got two semilunar valves, your aortic and your pulmonary. And think about the overall function of the heart. Well, it's going to pump deoxygenated blood to the lungs and it's going to pump oxygenated blood to the body and our cells. Anatomy of the heart. So basically think of the heart as a circle. And then think of the lungs, how it's either side, the sternum, how it's in front of that, and then the ribs on top as protection. So this allows you to think in very simple terms of the layering of the thorax. Then the mediastinum, well, what is it? It's essentially what is found in the midline of the thorax, and it can be divided into a superior aspect and an inferior aspect. So the superior aspect at the top runs from the first rib down to the horizontal plane of T4, thoracic vertebra number 4. Then the anterior and middle 
inferior mediastinum, so this is in this portion here, and the blue is anterior, orange is middle, and green is posterior. The anterior and middle run from this horizontal plane of T4 down to around T9 or T10, and then the posterior inferior mediastinum runs from T4 all the way down to T12, so that extends a little bit lower down. Another important concept is the pericardium, and again thinking about this in a simple diagrammatic view, this is the heart and this is your pericardium. It's a layer that surrounds the heart, and a clearer picture is this one here, and an even more in-depth picture is this one here. So understand that the heart has three layers, it's got this endocardium inner layer, the myocardium muscular layer, and then this outer epicardium, also called the visceral serous layer, um, which is the outer layer of the heart. So the pericardium can be divided into fibrous layer, which is on the outside, and a serous layer, but the serous layer can be further subdivided into a parietal and a visceral layer. And between these two layers, you have the pericardial cavity, which contains your pericardial fluid. This allows lubrication of the heart to allow it to expand um, and when it beats. So basic anatomy of the heart, be able to identify your basic arteries and veins. So maybe take this step by step by pausing the video or using the slides which can be found under the documents tab of the website. So arteries, basic artery anatomy, also veins, particularly the main three veins of the heart, the SVC, the IVC and the pulmonary trunk. Also be able to identify basic um, anatomy, so this is the apex for example. This is the left ventricle, this is the right atrium. So simple anatomy like that is really important, so surface anatomy we call that. And these are the coronary arteries and veins. To have a look inside the heart, should be able to simply identify the right atrium, ventricle, left atrium and left ventricle. Also be identified that this is the tricuspid valve and this is the bicuspid, clearly identified by identified by the fact that the bicuspid has two papillary muscle attachments via the chordae tendine and the tricuspid has three. This is a fossa ovalis, a fetal shunt. This is a semilunar valve and also this is a semilunar valve. This is the pulmonary one and this is the aortic at the back. As we've just discussed, the chordae tendine attach the valve to the papillary muscles which can contract to cause the valves to open and close. And then the three layers of the heart as previously discussed, so the endocardium inner layer the myocardium thick muscular layer and the epicardium the outer layer also called the visceral serous layer. Next be aware of the blood flow through the heart. So know that the blood comes in through the superior and inferior vena cava to the right atrium which it then goes through the tricuspid valve into the right ventricle and out through the pulmonary trunks or arteries to the lungs. Then it comes back in through the pulmonary veins, it's now oxygenated, comes into the left atrium through the bicuspid valve and then into the left ventricle and out through the aorta to the rest of the body. This concept's already been covered, so why is the left side of the heart much thicker? Well, it's because the left ventricles pump into the body, uh, which is much further away from the lungs which the right ventricle is pumping to, so the left ventricle requires much thicker musculature in order to be able to do this and create that higher pressure. Having a look at the heart from above, so the tricuspid valve can see that there's three demarcated cusps, where the bicuspid you can see that there's clearly two. You can also see your aortic and pulmonary valves here, which have also got three cusps each. So remember that tri means three, so that's your tricuspid valve separating your right side of the heart, and this is your bicuspid valve, which separates your left side of the heart, and it has two cusps. Also be aware of chest radiography, which is really important. Um, all types of radiography are essential in terms of learning for your exams, but chest radiography, um, think about the basic anatomy here. So even surrounding structures like your humerus or your clavicle. Then be aware of the borders of the heart, so know that this is the left ventricular border, and that this is the right atrial border. Again, be aware of simple details, so that this is the transverse process of the vertebra, and that these are the diaphragm. So next we talk about embryology, and think about basic principles of embryology first. So the heart's the first organ to develop within the embryo, and it's developed for around week four when it starts to function. And the reason for this is that the placenta can no longer support the embryo in its nutritional and oxygen requirements, so therefore the heart has to take over. And embryology can be thought of in these simple four steps, but let's have a look at them in a little bit more detail. 
One more key concept to appreciate is that prenatally the lungs are not active in gas exchange and therefore the pulmonary vessels are very vasoconstricted and this means that they are extremely narrow and under significant high pressure. The primordial heart and vascular system again as we've said starts to develop in about third and fourth week which is extremely early on in the pregnancy at which stage a lot of women don't even know they're pregnant. Normal veins um, carry deoxygenated blood in humans as we know however one special thing about fetal veins is that they carry oxygenated blood it's the opposite to normal adult veins and the same principle applies to arteries fetal arteries carry deoxygenated blood which is the opposite to normal arteries in the adult so think about embryology in three simple steps for the heart think about fusing the first so at start you start with two endocardial strands or two endocardial tubes which must, as the name implies of this step, fuse to form one endocardial tube, which the pericardial cavity is present around this endocardial tube. So remember, we've talked about the pericardium before. Step two is folding. So you've got this endocardial tube, and it's now going to elongate and develop into dilatations and constrictions, which means some parts are thicker than others. The bulbous cordis and the ventricle grow much faster than the rest of the heart, and as a result has to fold in on itself to cause this U shape. And then it continues to fold to form this S shape. Be aware of this as well, so this is the order at the start, but think about how this changes as the um, tube starts to fold and if this order changes. And how this changes as well um, in the adult, so think here the ventricles before the atrium, but actually in real life now we know that the atrium is before the ventricle in adults. Think about blood flow at this stage. So earlier we discussed adult blood flow, but think about fetal blood flow and how this compares. So it comes in through these vitiline, umbilical and cardinal veins into the sinus venous, then to the primordial atrium, the AV canal, the primordial ventricle, the bulbous cordis, truncus arteriosus, aortic sac, aortic arches, and then out to the embryo. Think about how this changes throughout the development of the heart. Step three is partitioning. And there are three things we need to partition in order to form our four chambers of the heart. So one, we need to part the AV canal. Two, we need to part the atria. And three, we need to part the ventricles. So first of all, let's part the AV canal. So very simply put, the endocardial cushions form these AV valves. So the endocardial cushions can be seen on the ventral and dorsal aspects here. And these simply come together to fuse to form the um, AV valves. Very simple concept. Step two, partition of the primordial atrium. And this is probably the most complicated one. So the membranous septum primum grows from the roof of the atria and little holes allow blood to move from atria to atria, so from the left to the right hand side via the foramen primum. The little holes become one big hole between the atria for continuous blood flow via the foramen secundum and the septum secundum grows downwards and overlaps to form a valve-like structure which is what we know as the foramen ovale, so that fetal shunt of blood from the right to the left hand side. Stage 3 here is the partitioning of the primordial ventricle. And what happens here is a chrysenteric muscle forms a median ridge in the floor of the ventricles and grows upwards by myoblast proliferation and grows to form that interventricular septum. This is very basic embryology and you could know it in a lot more detail than this but this outlines the key information that you need to know about embryology. Last point about embryology is remember the shunts. So first you have the ductus arteriosus in the embryo which becomes the ligamentum arteriosum in the adult and this allows blood to pass into the aorta through the ductus arteriosus and it allows us to bypass the lungs. Ductus venosus becomes the ligamentum venosum and it connects the umbilical vein to the IVC therefore the blood travelling through bypasses the liver. So two shunts here which allow us to bypass the lungs and liver. Another shunt which we need to be aware of is the foramen ovale, possibly the main well-known fetal shunt, which in the adult we refer to as the remnant, which is the fossa ovalis. So this, as we've just said, is a hole between the right and left atria, which allows blood, oxygenated blood coming from the umbilical vein, to bypass the pulmonary circulation by passing from the left to the right-hand side. So don't forget that all these shunts should close at birth, and if they don't, it can cause congenital heart defects. Be aware of the mechanism of how they close, because this isn't covered in this video, particularly to do with prostaglandins. And if they don't close, as we've said, this can cause congenital heart defects. Join us in part two, where we'll continue to look at the heart, the innovation, the blood supply, and so on. 
Um, I hope you found this video useful. Uh, if you do have any feedback, please feel free to leave it below. Thank you very much.